Welcome back. Let's start with this example. We have that an investment fund has an initial balance of $5,000 to begin the year. On March 1st, the fund dropped to $4,800 and a deposit of $800 was made. On June 1st, the fund balance was $5,200 and a withdrawal of $500 was made. The balance of the fund at the end of the year was $5,500. What is the time-weighted rate of return? All right, so in this problem, we want to find the time-weighted rate of return, right? Our problem explicitly asks us to find it. And in order to find a time-weighted rate of return, the first thing that I would recommend that you do is draw a timeline for the scenario described in your problem. And so in this case, it looks like we have four moments in time that we are going to want to make a note of on our timeline, right? We're gonna be looking at the beginning of the year where we have an initial balance, and we're gonna be looking at the end of the year where we have an ending balance, right? So that's already two moments in time that we are interested in. And then we are told of two other moments in time, March 1st and June 1st, where we have reported balances for the fund, as well as some cash flows that we need to be aware of. And so if we draw our timeline for this scenario, we'll have two endpoints and then two points in between, and so our first endpoint will be for the beginning of the year, or January 1st, and then our other endpoint will be the end of the year, or the final day of the year, which is December 31st. Okay, and then the other two dates that we know are March 1st and June 1st, and so I'll label those on our timeline as well, and so we will have March 1st and June 1st. Okay, so now we have all of our dates written down, but now let's write everything we know for each of these four dates. And so let's start with the beginning date. We know that the investment fund has an initial balance of $5,000 to begin the year. And so we will write that the balance is 5,000 at the beginning of the year. And then we're told that on March 1st, the fund dropped to $4,800. And so we will write that the fund is $4,800. And we're also told that there is a deposit of $800 made on that same date. And so below where I wrote the balance of the fund on March 1st, I'm going to write that there is a deposit of $800 by writing plus 800, right? This balance here does not include this deposit. This is the balance of the account on March 1st before any deposits or withdrawals are made, okay? So we need to write those two things separately. Do not combine them, keep them separate, okay? And then we're moving on to June 1st. And on June 1st, we know that the fund balance is $5,200. And so I will write 5,200 right there. And we are also told that there is a withdrawal of $500 made on that date as well. And so we will have minus 500 on June 1st as well. And once again, do not combine those values, right? This is the balance of the fund on June 1st before any deposits or withdrawals are made. And so we need to keep that separate from the actual withdrawal of $500. All right, and then finally, we are told that the balance of the fund at the end of the year is $5,500. And so for our last date on December 31st, we will have that the balance is $5,500. Okay, and so then if you set up your timeline just like I have right here, calculating the time-weighted rate of return is very simple and easy to do. Right, because in order to calculate the time-weighted rate of return, or TRR, we need to compound the returns over successive parts of the year that we have recorded right here. And that might sound like a difficult process, but it is actually fairly simple. What we will do to calculate this time-weighted rate of return is start by taking our first reported balance that is not the initial balance, and we are going to divide that amount by the initial balance, right? So we are going to have 4,800 divided by 5,000. And then we will multiply that by the next reported balance amount, which is 5,200, and divide that by the previous balance plus any cash flows, right? And so in this case, we will have our next balance of 5,200 and divide that by our previous balance of 4,800 plus 800, and so that will be 5,600. And then after that, we will multiply that by the next reported balance, which also happens to be the final balance of the year of 5,500, and we will divide that by the previous balance reported plus any cash flows that took place on that date. And so we will have 5,500 divided by 5,200 minus 500, and so that will be 4,700. 
Okay, and so now since we have used the final balance of this fund, we are done compounding the returns, and so now we will finish off this calculation by subtracting one. Okay, do not forget to subtract one at the end because that is key to getting your time-weighted rate of return. All right, and so it's really just that simple. This is the entire calculation for the time-weighted rate of return. As long as you set up your timeline exactly like I have right here, setting up this equation should not be too bad of a process. All right, and so if you were to plug this in your calculator, if you were to multiply these fractions together and subtract one, you would find that the time-weighted rate of return is equal to 0.043 and some more decimals, but we'll round that off and say that the time-weighted rate of return is 4.3%, right? That is the same as this decimal, and so that is the time-weighted rate of return and the solution to this example. Okay, so here's our second example. We have that given the following information about the activity in an investment account, determine the time-weighted rate of return. And so this is a little bit of a different problem. Instead of having a scenario described to us, we are actually shown the activity in an investment account with specific dates, the balance of the fund on those dates, and any deposits or withdrawals that took place on those dates as well. And so it's important to notice that this column right here says that these values are the fund value before any deposits or withdrawals, right? That's what this D slash W means. It means deposits or withdrawals, okay? And so we are actually given everything we need right here to solve for the time-weighted rate of return. But to make sure that we set up our equation correctly, I'm going to transfer this information into a timeline that I know how to understand and that I think that you will find to be a lot easier to use than this table of information. Okay, so let's draw a timeline. We have four moments in time that we are interested in, and so I will draw a timeline with two endpoints and two moments of time in between. And so our first date is January 1st, and so we will have 1-1, and then our second date is July 1st, so we will have 7-1. Our third date is October 1st, so we will have 10-1, and our last date is December 31st, the last day of the year, and so we will have 12-31. Okay, and so now let's record the balance of the fund on each of these dates before any cash flows or any deposits or withdrawals. And so on January 1st, we have $100, and so I will have $100 there. And then on July 1st, we have $130, and so we will have $130 there. On October 1st, we have $115, and so I will have $115 right there. And then for December 31st, we have $120, and so we will have $120 right there. Okay, and so now let's take care of our deposits and withdrawals. We have a withdrawal on July 1st, right? That's where this $10 is located in the row for July 1st. And so on July 1st, we will have a withdrawal of $10, which will be minus $10, okay? And then on October 1st, we have a deposit of $20. And so at that point on our timeline, we will have plus 20. Okay, and so now we have transferred all the information from this chart into our timeline here. And so now we can set up our equation to calculate the time-weighted rate of return. And so the time-weighted rate of return is equal to our first reported balance that is not the initial balance, right? So this balance right here divided by that initial balance, okay? So we take that first reported balance of 130 and divide it by the initial balance of $100. Then we multiply that by the next reported balance after the one we just used, and so that will be 115, and we will divide that by the previous balance plus any cash flows. And so that will be 130 plus negative 10, or 130 minus 10. And so we will have 115 divided by 130 minus 10, which is 120. And then that will be multiplied by our next reported balance, which is the final balance of 120, and we will divide that by the previous reported balance plus any cash flows. And so we will have 120 divided by 115 plus 20, which will be 135. Okay, so now we are done compounding the returns for this investment account, right? Because our last fraction involved using the balance at the end of the year. And so now we will subtract one and our equation for calculating the time-weighted rate of return is complete. We can now plug all of this into our calculator by multiplying these fractions together and then subtracting one. And we will find that the time-weighted rate of return is equal 
to 0 0.1074 and some more decimals. And so we can conclude that the time-weighted rate of return is 10.74%, right? That is the time-weighted rate of return and the solution to this problem. All right, so here's our final example. We have that an investment manager had a fund of $200 to start the year. On May 1st, a withdrawal of $10 was made. And then at the end of the year, the fund balance was $225. Given that the time-weighted rate of return is 18%, what was the balance of the fund on May 1st? And we are going to round that answer to the nearest whole number. All right, so this is a little bit of a different problem because we were told what the time-weighted rate of return is in this case, right? It's 18%. And so instead of looking for that rate, we are instead looking for a different value, which is the balance of the fund on May 1st. Okay, and so in order to figure out how we are going to calculate that balance, we should set up a timeline. Okay, and so the first thing that we want to do is figure out how many dates are going to be on our timeline. And so we know that we're going to have a beginning and an end to our timeline for the initial balance and the final balance. And so the only date in between there is May 1st, right? We have an initial balance of $200 and an ending balance of 225 and the only thing that takes place between those two balances is this withdrawal of $10 that is made on May 1st. And so we have three dates that we need to include on our timeline. And so I'll we'll draw our timeline here. We will have the two endpoints and then one date in between. All right, and so our first date will be January 1st. Our last date will be December 31st. And then our middle date is May 1st. And so we will have 5-1, okay? And so we know that the initial balance of the fund is $200, right? Because the investment manager has a fund of $200 to start the year. And so I'll write $200 at the beginning of the timeline. And then at the end of the year, the fund balance was $225, okay? And so I'll write 225 at the end of our timeline. But remember, we do not know what the balance of the fund is on May 1st. That is what we are looking for. Right, the problem is asking us what was the balance of the fund on May 1st. And so we don't know what that is, and so I'm going to represent that with a variable that we will call x. And that is what we are going to be solving for in this problem. However, there's one more thing that we need to make a note of, and that is that on May 1st, a withdrawal of $10 was made, and so we will write minus $10 underneath that balance of x for May 1st. Okay, and so then don't forget that we do know what the time-weighted rate of return is in this case, and so we know that the time-weighted rate of return is equal to 18%, which in decimal form is 0.18. Okay, and so now we have everything that we need to set up an equation using the time-weighted rate of return to solve for this value of the balance on May 1st. And so we know that the time-weighted rate of return, which is 0.18, will be equal to compounding the returns of the parts of this year in this scenario. And so we will start by taking the first reported balance of the fund and dividing it by the initial balance. And so in this case, that first reported balance is that value of x that we do not know. And so we will have x divided by that initial balance of $200. And then that will be multiplied by the next reported balance, which happens to be the final balance of the fund, and so we'll have 225 divided by the previous balance plus any cash flows. And so we will have 225 divided by x plus negative 10 or x minus 10. Okay, and so now since we use the final balance of the fund in one of our fractions for this equation, we are done writing fractions and we can subtract one from that equation. And now we have set up an equation that is true right, this time-weighted rate of return will be equal to this expression. All right, and so now what we wanna do is solve for x in this equation. And so what I'll do to start is add one to both sides of the equation to cancel out this negative one. And so if we add one to 0.18, we will have 1.18. And so if we continue our work up here, we will have that 1.18 is equal to x divided by 200 times 225 divided by x minus 10. Okay, and so then what we can do here to simplify this is note that we could rearrange how this is being multiplied and we would have that 1.18 is equal to 225 divided by 200 times x divided by x minus 10. 
right? It doesn't matter what order you multiply these two values in. And so we can swap them. And so now we can see that 225 divided by 200 will reduce to 9 eighths if we divide both of those numbers by 25. And so I'll erase that and we'll have 9 eighths. And then if we multiply both sides by the reciprocal of 9 eighths, we can cancel that out on this side of the equation. And so if we multiply 1.18 by 8 ninths, which would be the reciprocal of 9 eighths, then we will have that 1.048 repeating will be equal to x divided by x minus 10. All right, and so then if we clean up our work here, our next step will be to multiply both sides of the equation by x minus 10. And so if we do that, we'll have 1.048 repeating times x minus 10, and that will be equal to x, right? And so then if we distribute this value through this quantity, we will have 1.048 repeating times x minus 10.48 repeating, and that will still be equal to x, okay? And so then if we subtract one x, or just this x right here, from this term of x, we will have 0.048 repeating times x, and then if we add this constant to the other side of the equation, that will be equal to positive 10.48 repeating, and so now all we have to do to solve for x is divide both sides by 0.048 repeating, but before we do that, let's clean up our work. And what we'll find if we divide both sides by 0.048 repeating is that x will be equal to 214.5, which if we round to the nearest whole number means that x will be equal to 215. And that is the solution to this problem, right? We just figured out that the balance of the fund on May 1st was $215. And so that makes sense because if you look at our timeline here, our other balances were pretty close to that value, right? We had an initial balance of 200 and a final balance of 225. And so a balance on May 1st of 215 totally makes sense. And so we can conclude that this is the correct answer to this problem. Okay, and so that was the last example for this video. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments. But if you don't have any questions, this is all I had for now. So I will see you next time.